Hello, welcome to this video on the FDTD method. Um, I will try to go over the basic concepts in the FDTD, finite difference time domain method. Uh, the FDTD method is, a, is a one of the most widely used techniques in um, obtaining numerical solutions of electromagnetic problems. It's used to simulate uh, antennas, um, radar systems, um, all type of electromagnetic problems can be simulated using the FDTD method. Uh, I'll go over the basics. There are thousands of papers written in, on this subject, so I'll just try to scratch the surface. Um, and uh, anyone who wants to build more on that will have probably to do extensive reading on the different applications of this method. Okay, for those who would like to read more about the subject and has a good source, I strongly recommend the book of Sherbini and Damir. Um, it's a very simple book. They supply lots of MATLAB codes. Uh, they go step by step in, in driving the different methods. Um, and uh, I should mention that I have the honor of working with uh, Professor Sherbini and Damir in, on my second book. So, um, so they are experts in this area and their book is one of the, I would say, the simplest books you can read about the subject. Okay, now we start to talk about the quantities we are going to be using. Um, the electric, of course, there is something called the electric field uh, vector. Um, its units are volt per meter. Okay, so there is electric field. It has three components at every point in space. There is something called magnetic field, H. It has three components at every point in space. Its, its units are ampere per meter. There is something called the electric flux density vector or the displacement vector. It has three units at every point, a point in space. Its units are per meter squared. There is something called the vector B, magnetic flux density vector. It is in Weber's per meter squared. There is an embraced current, embraced current density, GI. Uh, and this is a current that results from a source. So if you have an antenna and you have a source, you can draw something like this. You have an antenna. Um, and this antenna is radiating, okay, because you are putting a source here, and this source will will result in some current flowing on the surface of the antenna. So there will be some current flowing here. This is called the embraced current, okay? Uh, so this is a current that's resulting from a source. Uh, the second type of current, we already talked about this one in the lecture, it's called the conduction current. And the conduction current, by definition, uh, G conduction is equal to the conductivity multiplying the electric field. So this one here is what gives rise to the losses that we have in, in the conductor. The last one is the displacement current, and this one was added by Maxwell uh, to balance Maxwell's equations. And this displacement current is given by this expression here. This G displacement is equal to partial D, partial T. And this is a current that flows in capacitors. Because in capacitors, we don't have current due to flow of the charges, but rather current due to the rate of change of the electric field. So this value is partial D, partial T here. This is called the displacement current. So these are the, all the quantities that we have. We have sources, this embraced source, and this embraced source will give rise to all these fields. And uh, we have, of course, a conduction current, and we have displacement currents. And these are related to the electric field and the rate of change of the electric field. Now, we should not lose sight of what's our target in this, in using FDTD. Our target is, given any excitation current, any source that you have, uh, maybe it may be the current flowing on the surface of the antenna of your cell phone, the current flowing on the surface of the tablet, of the, of the antenna of your tablet, or uh, any other source that you can have in nature, would like to find the electric field and the magnetic field, so E of T and the H of T, at any point space at any time t using Maxwell's equations. So Maxwell's equations relate all these uh, of quantity through differential equation, through a number of differential equations. Actually, there are six of these differential equations. And uh, of course, there is an integral form of Maxwell equation. There is a differential form of Maxwell's equation. In our lectures, we, uh, we used only the isotropic case. So we said that d is equal to epsilon e. We assume that E is the same for all components, but in reality and in many materials, epsilon will be different in different directions. In that case, you simply write dx is equal to epsilon x multiplying ex, and dy is epsilon y multiplying ey, and the same applies for z. So in that case, we have to define at every point in space three permittivities. 
the permittivity in the x direction epsilon x, the permittivity in the y direction epsilon y, permittivity in z direction epsilon z. The permeability relates the vectors b and h um, in the same way that the permittivity relates the vector d and e. So, in, uh, we have, of course, we have this expression here that b is equal to mu, e, mu h. Okay? Uh, permeability is another property of matter. Uh, in the isotropic case, it is the same mu for all directions. In the general case, well, it's not really very general because it can be a tensor, but let's assume for now that we, for every orientation, for every direction, we can have different permeability. So we can simply say that Bx is equal to mu x hx, By is equal to mu y hy, and Bz is equal to mu z hz. Now, so this must be given at the, at the start of the simulation. What are the properties of all the materials that you have in your domain? What are the properties of the uh, dielectrics that you have in the antenna? What are the properties of the, of the metal you are using? One other property is the conductivity. So far, we assume that we have isotropic conductivity. We said that J is equal to sigma E. So we assume that sigma is the same in all directions. But in general, uh, sigma can be actually a matrix. And for now, we just assume that we have different sigmas in different directions. So the current, in the, X, the current density in the X direction is equal to sigma X EX. Current density in the Y direction, GY, is equal to sigma Y EY. Current density, current density in the z direction, jz, is equal to sigma z, ez. So, we, the, all these must be given, the epsilons, the permittivities, the permeabilities, and the conductivities at every point in our computational domain. So, we have to fully determine the materials we have, we have to fully determine the excitation, and then we have to find now a way to solve Maxwell's equations in order to find E of t and H of t. The way we have been doing it in lecture so far, we just find analytical solution, meaning that we find E as an analytical function of X, Y, Z. We didn't talk about time yet, but everything really in electromagnetics can be a function of time. So, right now, this will be a numerical solution, so we'll obtain the electric fields and magnetic fields as numbers. We cannot write them as analytical expressions, okay? So now let's start to see how, how we go about driving uh, the basic equations governing the FDTD method. Okay, so the FDTD method is a method to find the solution of the electric and magnetic field that everywhere in the space at all time steps, for all time. Um, we solve the problem in time. If you want to find uh, something like, um, you, get, you want to find something in the frequency domain, you have to take a Fourier transform. This is more advanced subject. Um, and uh, the basic idea in finite difference time domain is that we approximate all the first order derivatives in Maxwell's equations through finite difference approximation. And then we try to drive a, a time a time marching scheme that gives us the fields at, at one time step, given all the fields available at the previous time step. Uh, there are many other techniques like transmission line modeling, TLM, that also solves for the electric field and magnetic field, but here in FDT we have staggering of these fields as I will show you in a second. So the fields are not defined at the same point in space, are not defined at the same time even. And this was the brilliance of the, of the FDT method which was devised by Yi, uh, I think it was 1960s, a very brilliant idea and it enabled um, a very interesting way of solving Maxwell's equations. Okay, so he came up with this idea in 1966, and it was a number of years until it picked momentum. His, his idea is very simple. Maxwell's equations are first order differential equation, partial differential equations relating the electric field and the magnetic field and the current excitation. Why don't we go and approximate all these first order derivatives using second order accurate central finite differences. This is a formula for approximating the derivative at any point x. You take half a step delta x, half delta x in the forward direction, and then calculate the function. Take a half a step delta x in the backward direction, and then calculate the function. And then if you subtract these two and then you divide by delta x, this will give you a good approximation of the, of the derivative of the function at the point x. 
So here, in order to calculate the function derivative at the point x, it require two function evaluations, one in the forward direction, a little bit perturbed with half delta x in the forward direction, and another function evaluation perturbed in the backward direction by half delta x. And using, we subtract these two, divide by delta x, this will give us this approximation of the derivative. This is coming, by the way, the origin of this coming from Taylor's expansion of functions, and um, uh, people who work in mathematics know this, uh, know, know this derivation very well. Okay, here. So here I have a function f of x. Um, uh, this function is given by this black line here. So this is f of x. Your target is to find the derivative at the point x naught. So we have a point x naught here. Remember, this is a function of one variable, okay? So this is the x-axis. At value x naught, the function will have this value here, which is f of x naught. At the point x naught minus delta x over 2, the function will have the value of f of x naught minus delta x over 2. So here we have perturbation of half delta x in the backward direction. Here we have x naught plus delta x over 2. So we have uh, a perturbation of delta x over 2 in the forward direction. And the function value here is f of x naught plus delta x over 2. So... What, what the idea of E is, if you want to find the derivative here, the derivative means the slope, the slope of this curve. Well, you approximate this slope at the difference between this value and this value, and then divide by this distance. And this distance is delta x. This is the whole idea. So you can see this slope here is parallel to this line here. Okay? So, uh, so this is the slope I'm looking for. So the slope can be approximated as f of x naught plus delta x over 2 minus f of x naught minus delta x over 2 divided by this distance here, which is delta x. So this is the expression we have to use. The same expression applies also if you have multiple, multi, uh, a function of multivariables. So this is very important to understand because in electromagnetics, all the fields, say the electric field, for example, uh, the electric field Ex is a function of x, y, z, and t. It varies at uh, with x, y, z, and t. So in that case, you perturb one of the parameters, you keep the others fixed. So the derivative relative to x here, for example, at any point, you take a half delta x step in the x direction, calculate the electric field, and then half a step delta x, so half a step delta x over 2 in the, in, the, in the backward direction, and then you calculate e x again, and then you subtract them, and then you divide by delta x. You do this while keeping y, z, and t fixed. You can do the same exactly for time. You can perturb time, keeping x, y, and z uh, the same, okay? So the same expression still applies even if you have a function of multivariables. Okay, now we start to talk about the actual implementation of the FDTD method. You are given some computational domain. This is the domain in which you'll be calculating our electric fields. The problem has to be discretized. So you divide your domain into a number of cells. They can be square or rectangular in shape. It doesn't matter. So this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis, this is the z-axis. This cell here, cell 1, 1 and 1. This cell here is cell i, g and k. This cell here is cell n, x, n, y and n, z. So we have n, x cells in the x direction, n, y cells in the y direction, and n, z cells in the z direction. So you can imagine this domain as being divided into small br bricks. Each one of them has size delta x, delta y, and delta z. Okay? And the, the, brilliant, the brilliant idea or the brilliant idea that Yi came up with is how to define the fields inside each one of these cells. Okay? So our target is find the fields associated with these cells over the entire domain. And by doing that, we solve with the fields everywhere. Okay, this figure here really ex shows the essence of the of the idea that Yi came up with. Yi cell, okay, let's define this node as node i, g, and k. Remember, this is x, this is this is y, and this is z. This node is i plus one, g, and k. This node here, let me be to cover with this one first. This one here is i, j, k plus one. This one here is i, j plus 1, and k plus 1, and so on. What he said, okay, I'm going to define the field components in the middle of the edges. So you can see this is a cell. This is one cell. This one cell of the ones we talked about. He defined the electric field in the x di in direction in the middle of this edge. 
So it is shifted by half delta x in the x direction. He defined the electric field in the y direction to be along this direction here in the middle of the edge. So it's defined half delta y in the y direction. And the same thing for the z component here. It's defined in the middle of this edge, so it is shifted half delta z in the z direction. And he defined the magnetic field components at the middle of the faces of this cell. So you can see here, this one here is defined in the middle of this face. This is a one of the faces of this cell. This is the x direction. So this is hx here is defined exactly in the middle. So you can see hx is shifted by half delta y in the y direction and half delta z in the z direction. Similarly, to take a look at hy. hy is pointing this way. Okay? It's pointing this way. So this is hy related to this cell, or to this node here. This hy, you can see it is shifted by half delta x in the x direction and half delta z in z direction. The same thing is happening for hz. hz is defined in the middle of this face. See, it's exactly in the middle. And it's shifted by half delta x in the x direction and half delta y in the y direction. This brilliant idea resulted in a very interesting phenomenon because every magnetic field is surrounded by four electric fields. And actually, if you draw a number of cells together, you'll see that every electric field is surrounded by four magnetic fields as well. If you put two cells together, this is what you're going to be seeing. And this is actually the statement of Maxwell's equations. Because Maxwell's equations simply are simply saying that the curl, curl of E is equal to minus partial B, partial T. The rate of a change, if the magnetic field is changing with time, then the curl of the electric field will not be zero. So the electric field is circulating around every point where the magnetic field is not zero. So this what this what's happening here, because you can see the electric field will be circulating around this component of the magnetic field. The same thing is happening maybe on this face here. You can see four components of the electric field surround one component of the magnetic field. Here as well, one component of the magnetic field is surrounded by four components of the electric field. So this is the first maximum equation. The second one is uh, curl of H is equal to uh, J, J, J plus partial D partial T. And uh, J, this J here can be uh, embraced the current, conduction current, uh, actually, it can be this. Actually, it's, uh, generally, it's the sum of both. This current here can be the embraced current and it can be the conduction current as well. So J is equal to J conduction plus J embraced. Um, so now we see the why this this way of organizing the fields very interesting. The fields are not defined at the same point, even though we'd like to, to solve them at the same point, but they are not defined at the same point. They are staggered. Uh, electric fields at the middle of the edges, magnetic fields at the middle of the faces. And also, they are also staggered in, in, in time, because the electric fields will be defined at, at multiples of delta t. Delta t is our time step. The algorithm has to go in time steps. While A or the h's are defined at, at, ha at odd multiples of half delta t. So one, one half delta t, three over two delta t, five over two delta t, and so on. So, to clarify the notation, we agree that if I talk about the electric field related to node I and J and K, it is shifted by half delta X in the X direction. You can see this half here in the X direction, but no half in the Y and Z. The electric field in the Y direction related to node I, J and K is shifted by half delta Y in the Y direction. The electric field EZ related to the node I, J and K is shifted by half delta Z in the Z direction. The opposite happens to the magnetic fields. Magnetic field in the x direction at node i, j, and k, or related to node i, j, and k, is shifted by half delta y and half delta z. Magnetic field hy related to node i, j, and k is shifted by half delta x and half delta z. There is no shift in the y direction, even though it's hy. And the same thing is happening here. Remember that the magnetic fields are defined in the middle of the faces, while the electric fields are defined in the middle of the edges. So now all these now will form arrays. You have an array called EX. We'll have a large number of them. It's a three-dimensional array because EX exists for every node. The same thing for HY, EY, for EZ, the same thing for HX, for HY, for HZ. So our target is 
find the values of these fields at every time step and update them as the algorithm proceeds from 0 delta t to 1 delta t to 2 delta t. And by the way, the delta t we are using here is very small because the velocity of light, the electromagnetic waves travel at the velocity of light, which is 3, 10 to the power 8 meter per second. So this will be in the micro, in the microsecond, uh, usually, or even a fraction, and uh, action, actually it's not micro, it's picosecond. It's going to be a very tiny, maybe 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 11. This is usually the time scale we use for delta T. Okay, the last thing to remember, we agreed that the electric and magnetic fields are not defined at the same points in space, even though they are related to one node, and every node will have associated with it six components, three electric and three magnetic, but they are staggered. The magnetic fields are defined at the center of the faces, electric fields at the far center of the edges. One other staggering that Yi introduced and it was extremely brilliant is that they said, okay, the electric field the components, I'm going to store them at, at multiples of delta t. So Ex will be stored at zero, delta t, two delta t, three delta t, and so on. While the magnetic field, I will sample them at odd multiples of half delta t. So one half delta t, three over two delta t, five over two delta t, and so on. So, to clarify the notation we are going to be using, the electric field EZ related to node I, G, and K at time N delta T will be labeled by EZ N of I, G, and K. So it's the electric field in the Z direction related to node I, G, and K calculated at time N delta T is labeled by EZ N of I, G, and K. The same thing happens for the magnetic field. The Y component of the magnetic field positioned at, this is node I, G, and K. Okay, remember, if it is Y component, then we shift X and we shift Z by half delta X and half delta Z. Okay, and this will be sampled at odd multiples of half delta T. So N plus 1 half delta T, we denote it that way. Okay, remember, even though this one is written as H, Y, I, G, and K, N plus 1 half. This means, this not exactly at node I, G, and K. It is related to node I, G, and K, but it's staggered to be in the middle of the face. And here we calculate it at odd multiples of half delta T. Okay, one last complication that comes out from the way Yi organized the electric fields is that, for example, we know that at this edge we define EX. But in order to calculate DX here, we have to calculate multiply by epsilon here. So we have to multiply by epsilon X at, uh, at this location. We call this one here epsilon X of I, J, and K. So it, remember it's shifted by half delta X, as we agreed. But this epsilon, this permittivity, it is defined at an edge. Imagine that this cell is made of dielectric, but all the other neighboring cells in the YZ plane are made of air. So we have here one cell, which is inside the electric, surrounded by three cells, which are air. In that case, the value I'm going to be using here must be an interpolated value. For example, epsilon x if it's just one cell of the electric and three made of air, then epsilon, the epsilon r you're going to be using, I can simply write it this way. Epsilon r will be equal to one quarter epsilon r that of the of the dielectric epsilon rx here plus 0.75 multiplied by 1 which is uh, the permittivity of free space okay so um so even though this dielectric here may have dielectric constant of 3 but it's it's surrounded in the yz plane by three cells uh, each one of them is air so in that case you have to use interpolation because the, the effective permittivity here is not that of this dielectric only, because all the other cells around it have epsilon naught equal epsilon equal to epsilon naught. So the effective permittivity or relative permittivity is given by this one here. Okay? So this is called interpolation, and uh, this is done automatically by the solver. You don't have to worry about that. You define the material, and the solver automatically determine the proper value of the effective the permittivity effective permeability and the effective conductivity to be used. Uh, the same thing if happen will be for the conductivity, because here the sigma will be sigma defined here. Remember, J is equal to sigma E. 
So Gx, the conductivity in the x direction, or sorry, the, the current density in the x direction, will be equal to sigma x multiplying Ex. So it's, sigma x will be defined here. But this sigma, again, this, this dielectric can have its own sigma, but sigma of the surrounding area is equal to zero. Then you have to have interpolation to find the effective conductivity.